everyone and welcome to the CX Green Room. Really excited about today's show. For the last couple of months, we've been in an AI news cycle frenzy with ChatGPT providing a generative AI chatbot for consumer use. For anyone who's tried it out, you know it can do some pretty smart things, but it can also give out wrong answers that sound authoritative. We've seen organizations testing it with some degrees of success. We've also seen consumer blowback and many organizations either banning it or quickly issuing guidelines as it raises important concerns about security and data privacy. So here to talk to us today and to answer some really tough questions that we like to throw out in the CX green room, we have Brett Weigel, who's SVP and general manager for digital AI and journey analytics at Genesis. Welcome, Brett. Thanks, Claire. Uh, nice to be here today. Thanks for having me. And, We're so and glad you're here, Brett. And you know, as a big hitter, because uh, we, you know, we have all the heavy hitters in the CX green room in the industry. Right, as a big course. hitter, we've of course asked you what your special green room item is for today's show. So tell us what it is and why. Uh, well, blue bottle coffee. Uh, my my mornings start early. I have lots of uh, wonderful colleagues uh, in in the UK, Israel, and beyond. Uh, some of them even working on AI, and um, you know. So as a result, uh, I need to heavily caffeinate to to have those early morning <laughs> meetings. So uh, was fortunate enough to receive some uh, some lovely uh, blue bottle coffee, and uh, thanks very much, Ginger and Claire. Ginger, did you get yourself some Incredible. blue bottle? Well, I am not a coffee drinker, but I do love Earl Grey tea, so I am also caffeinated. I <laughs> am caffeinated as well. Not a, not have... a sponsored product placement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we do this every week. We've had quite a range. Uh, there's no blue bottle in the UK, as far as I'm aware, but I do have a beautiful uh, Ethiopian coffee that my friend brought me back from Addis. Uh, which I'm currently drinking at five in the afternoon in the UK. So it's going to be an interesting evening for me. Yeah, we'll be, late <laughs> one. <laughs> we'll be sure to uh, send you some, you know, content to, to edit at like 10 yeah. o'clock time or something to give you something to do while you're not sleeping. I, I, I believe you, Ginger. I think you will. <laughs> well, every, now that everyone's caffeinated, I think we should jump in and start talking about AI. So Brett, for those who aren't, fully immersed in AI and what's happening out there. Can you please explain a little bit about what is natural language understanding versus generative AI and how large language models fit into the latter? Sure, yeah, I mean, so, you know, what's interesting is there's very little that's brand new uh, uh, about what we've seen in the last couple of years really come to the fore, but, you know, this area of natural language processing has for some time had the goal of trying to understand inputs, right? And, and you know, either formed in terms of just understand basic things about language that's put in. You see, um, you know, speech to text kind of applications like spoken and then IVR, right? Where behind the scenes, we're trying to understand what the audio is really saying, translating that into language and then trying to figure out what the, the, the user wants. Chatbots similar, but it start as starts as text, right? And and many systems have been constructed to um, try to come up with a response. So the generative part really comes with the ability based on um, larger forms of input and and you know sort of self guided learning, where where the AI can learn from a much larger body of of text. Uh, that um, that these new forms of AI can actually generate uh, generate text responses that seem and feel human, um, and uh, where we you know have even seen image, video, computer code. There's other forms of this beyond text. We think of it as text, but there's also a lot going on that's multimodal, right? Um, and and in other modalities than than, than just text responses. We've seen various interfaces before, uh, but everyone's talking about chat GPT. And is it, I'm asking, an AI mega event? Would you help to separate the hype from reality for us? Yeah, I mean, I think it is an important moment, right? We've really kind of, um, we, we've, we've 
we've crossed a little bit into where it really starts to feel much more human, where people are really kind of amazed by what they can do. And if you really watch, you know, I, I, I read Twitter and other press tech crunch, these types of, um, you know, pl places for the chatter to uh, continue. Um, you know, the advances are pretty amazing. We've really, you know, I think the, the, the thing to get is nothing about this is specifically new. Really, it's about the number of parameters that the computational power that we can actually throw at the problem um, can, can, can actually make use of, right? You know, so we're sort of looking at a moment where um, you're talking about billions of inputs um, that have meaning. We're talking about, you know, sort of self su self supervised learning, which means that you can point um, a large language model at, you know, a training corpus, which is, you know, a big portion of the internet, or you know, sort of um, j just tons and tons of electronic books. It can it can learn from very large um, inputs like that behind the scenes, and so then you get things that are much more, you know, sort of broadly based and truly general in terms of, hey, ask it anything, you can get a, a, a fairly credible response, right? But, you know, what I would say is, is that um, it's not yet true, you know, it, we, we haven't created the singularity where there's, you know, sort of some autonomous robot that's going to rule the world. We're um, quite a far way away from that. But I think that there is, you know, th there is a, you know, it's an important moment. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a truly, um, you know, meaningful advance in uh, what we've seen in AI historically. Yeah, I was just at Enterprise Connect last week and um, everyone talking about generative AI was saying that it was going to be transformative for customer experience, but they were, everyone was also throwing in the caution of you know, don't let it run amok, make sure that there's a human involved and make sure that you're not letting it take over your critical thinking. So you know, with that in mind, how does generative AI, specifically in the customer experience, how is it using all these data inputs? You know, what should you use it for? Maybe what should you use in it? Should, shouldn't you use it for right now? Um, and any exciting case studies or use, use cases rather in customer experience right now? Yeah, so I mean, I think, look, you know, it, it's it's important, number one, to separate the consumer facing versions of this from the underlying libraries and models that, you know, companies and organizations can take advantage of. And, you know, talking to a lot of the world's leading brands who are Genesis customers, um, you know, big banks, healthcare, these are these are people from regulated industries that have to be careful. Um, even these kinds of companies are starting up skunk works projects to understand what's underneath the hood here because the reality is this will affect the world of cx and cx strategy and you know we need to be ahead of it and as a, as a vendor we're you know in, investing in that heavily as well um when you see chat gpt the publicly um available uh, uh product from open ai that's a uh, th that's that's a general purpose chatbot that can be thrown at a lot of problems, but the inputs are not controllable by the organization using it. Right. So when you talk about someone kind of dipping in and throwing in prompts and inputs into the chatbot for proprietary stuff that company is doing, well, you know, that actually is risky from the standpoint of number one, you're you're kind of adding to the body of work, the inputs that you're prompting the bot with. And then number two is um, you really don't know the complete lineage of the data that was used to train it, right? So there's, there's a huge corpus we actually don't know. We, we know it's probably a couple of years old in the case of GPT-4 and a little bit older in the case of GPT-3.5. But the idea is, is that we want to be able to vet what it was trained on, right? And make sure that that was brand specific. Um, and I think that there's like also uh, the ability to kind of filter and control and make safe the outputs, right? So that... Mm -hmm. Um, and, and and this is actually that that layer is it's a place where we will heavily invest as a vendor in the space. 
But I think that that's actually where a lot of the cool tech and money will be made in this is, you know, the commercially viable version for enterprise software. What does that need to do? Well, it really needs to have that filtering layer that makes sure that regulatory compliance, all those kinds of things are there and that the right transparency has been created. Um, but there's there's a lot of really cool applications in, in one of our products, for instance, what we've done is we've said, um, let's use this type of technology to create alternate email templates that you might send to customers. So product exceed.ai has uh, the ability to ask people about their product interest, qualify their interest and schedule a meeting with a sales development person to then have that conversation about what do you want to buy? Well, it starts with an email and you have an email template with mail merge fields, et cetera, right? Now you can create five versions of it really quickly. You can do a B or multivariate testing. You can figure out which one works the best and it's all safe because you're not, there's no PII in that template. It's sort of dear first name, right? And, and, and then a bunch of ensuing text. So we can, you know, we can quickly spin up variations that are completely safe and give you options that might actually improve your customer experience as, as an example. The list goes on, you know, sort of generic chatbot content, make it sound more human, mm -hmm. um, create draft knowledge articles, um, the, the, list, the list goes on, yeah. And call, call summarizations? Is how does that is that? Yeah, so uh, so 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 call or interaction summarization. I would zoom out from calls, but um, that that's an area where we're investing, and we actually have features coming out uh, now as part of our agent assist product. And really, the the use case there is pretty simple. At the end of a call or a chat, um, customer agents will uh, tend to write up some notes so that we know later what that overall interaction was about and uh, you know save a history so we can extract from the actual conversation what happened right and 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 take a look at that and you know we um we use some open source libraries uh, that are large language model with um the ability to plug that into um uh, text prompts and uh you know we with it within seconds, you can create a very credible summary and it saves that agent. You know, if you multiply the time that every agent in a thousand person contact center spends on that, um, you're, you're really saving uh, potentially, you know, high hundreds of thousands, to, you know, to, to a million dollars a year just on the time spent in typing up these notes. So, so it's, it's really amazing. That's a huge productivity saving. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things, you know, we often talk about at Genesis is about empathy and empathy, particularly towards our customers and our employees. How do we balance some of the value creation aspects of the potential for these technologies with that empathy towards the individual? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like with all AI, it's kind of interesting, you know, it's and it's really not AI that I think people worry about. It's the automation aspect of it, right, where you know, sort of you, you, you want to, you want to be treated as a human and a, as an end user, you want to be treated as a human in a targeted personalized way, but that doesn't break your sense of privacy or your rights to privacy. Right. So that sort of, that summarizes the end user sort of concerns. And then on the employee side, right. Humans want to have a role. They want to be respected in the workplace. They want to make sure that they um, can succeed, uh, and, and that, you know, their own, um, worker rights are, are sort of adhered to and, 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 and that they, uh, they're respected both, you know, humanly and legally in, in, in the workplace. And I think the application of AI is compatible with both sets of concerns, right? In the sense that we, we can be more targeted and save employees time for higher, you know, sort of higher importance or, or, or uh, value work. And employees can be more productive in what they do because now you can use AI as an assistant to, you know, what, what if every employee had an AI assistant is, is a good question to ask in terms of thinking about the workplace. Having said that, I mean, organizations do need to invest in looking at how to do these things ethically to not run afoul of issues that do arise, such as, you know, I mean, very famous examples of, can I use, 
can I use a zip code to target? Well, yeah. Now, now that now now that generative AI can create a lot of content really really quickly, uh, where in some cases we're not clear on what the inputs really were that got us there. Um, things like bias or it tripping over a regulatory boundary, it can be a lot harder to figure out has that even happened, right? It can be much more insidious, right? So we, we, we just have to be careful and really conscious and uh, ad ad adhere to, you know, sort of um, consciously defined principles like our AI ethics guidelines that we, that, that we publish publicly. So you've mentioned, you know, some use cases that don't include PII for the same reasons, right? The ethical concerns, and you just went through some key ones. Any other ethical concerns that maybe people aren't thinking about that re they really need to pay attention to um, when using or developing with AI? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the one of the things to be aware of is this concept that I mentioned earlier on data lineage. So, you know, the way that you know, large language models are, you know, working is that, um, you, you know, you're doing unsupervised learning, which means you point the the model at a really large corpus of, of text or, you know, in the case of images, images, right? And the learning is self-supervised. You can observe the outputs and things like that. Um, what the training data was could include things like, um, uh, personally identifiable information, um, or just generally content that could be construed as owned by an individual, right? But it's not entirely clear with most of these systems, how do you adhere, for instance, to GDPR, the right to be forgotten, the right mm -hmm. to um, know that your data is being used, and a little bit becomes, you know, you get some of these ex post facto issues, such as, you know, if it if it hoovered up forum content from before GDPR even existed, well, it's a little hard to imagine how you would retroactively apply the GDPR <laughs> to content mm -hmm. before. But the, you know, the idea is really that you you need to be aware of what those inputs are and that that they are safe, right? So it, this is why, you know, you sort of see this bifurcation between the consumer products where some of those things are less transparent. Um, business friendly products are beginning to emerge. So for instance, our partners at Amazon, uh, part of Amazon Web Services, they have services coming that are, you know, sort of versions of large language models and these kinds of generative techniques that are available as services where the you know the software vendor has full control over input and output, and so that's that 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 gives you a lot uh, uh, firmer ground. But the, but there are you know you in in Europe right now, both Italy and Spain are investigating uh, some of the companies around generative AI um, based on uh, based on these kinds of GDPR concerns. So it's um, so it's an emerging space, and you know the I would expect legislation. Um, yeah. Hopefully, it's well-informed legislation. I, I, I do I do worry a little bit about lawmakers' ability to even understand how this stuff is different and what's really going on. But um, you know, hopefully, they get there, and hopefully, we can regulate in a sensible way that still uh, allows for innovation in the space. So, Brett, thanks so much for helping us understand what we're doing at Genesis and what's next. Um, a question I have for you personally: What are you most excited about in this area? I mean, I think that, you know, the 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 idea of um, time savings in uh, um, kind of, a, you know, a, a companion for your life, I think it can be really transformative for us as these products come along. You know, I think a lot of us have, um, you know, years ago, Apple had this really famous video with the knowledge navigator and it had like a computer that you opened on your desk. And it would kind of walk you through your day and, you know, help you with various op open form questions. Right. And this was in the 90s when I was starting to when I was starting my tech career um, was really inspired by that. And I, I feel like we're um, we've gotten closer with the likes of, you know, popular virtual assistants like Siri and OK Google and these types of things. But 
um, even they have been pretty limited and specific and I struggle to get the right thing to play on my Spotify playlist at times, right? <laughs> but I think we're getting to the point where you can get autonomous activity going that's really useful. Like I'm driving, I need an alternate route, find me three alternate routes and I want the following things to be true, right? You know, the reality is even, even, even with spoken prompts and cars, you pretty much have to pull over to perform some of these activities, you know? Yeah. I want to hit blue bottle to get my coffee. <laughs> I need to get gas. And um, I don't want to be on any road that has more than six lanes. <laughs> you know, and this kind of prompt, right, is sort of impossible with current mapping software and generic chatbots and things like that. But we're very close to this, right, where background tasks can spin up very quickly, get the answer. Um, and, you know, we can kind of go on with our day. And I think that the, the idea of then if you apply that to your business life or you apply that to your personal life, it really starts to become uh, pretty transformative, right? And, you know, there's, there's simply then, you know, changes sort of what work means, right? You can do more with less or with, with less time. Um, and, and I think that gets pretty exciting. Yeah. I mean, that, there's so much, it seems like there's so much opportunity. So I have one last question for you. Um, you know, a lot of what you talked about is there's, well, there's a, the productivity side, but then there's also that personalization side, right? So where do you see um, customer service and marketing kind of having to come together mm. to make sure that this all works to the best that it can versus like, no, I want the personalization. No, I want the personalization. Yeah. Well, what I, you know, what I would say is number one, that th th this is both good and bad, right? So generative AI, large language models don't actually help all that much with what does a customer want and need, right? Um, it's, it's more about given that I understand what the customer wants and needs, what are some things that I could say to her or to him, right? that based on these inputs sound credible, right? Um, what would sound credible for this use case? And then you get a lot of content immediately, you get variations, you get even, you know, video and text and things that would also be useful. Now, making sure it's safe, that's the number one, right? But the number two then is um, taking advantage of that variation and generation capability to really save a lot of time, right? It means that we can create, in theory, more human, more engaging experiences, but we still have to invest in other forms of AI and, and other forms of technology that sit alongside of, right? So you still need intent detection. Mm -hmm. What does somebody really want to need? Um, what segment are or, or what what segment are they in, and what does their behavior tell us about them? Um, and, and you know, there's techniques like sequence learning that help with questions like, what segment should be uh, should someone be in given this series of actions, right? And how can we tune that over time? So these are other forms of AI that we continue to invest in, and they're very much marketing kind of things, right? But then you start to apply that to the ability to enable self-service at scale because generative AI really does that, right? So then you get the idea of truly useful self-service that um, helps us with our wants and needs much more quickly, right? Um, which always means then for the world of the contact center that you can spend time on, you know, the true mysteries <laughs> in customer service that are hard to solve. There's always this set of edge cases where you, it really produces the most unhappy customers, it produces the longest handle times, it produces the wrong, longest response times, because you don't really know what to do and you have to go and investigate and talk to people throughout your company, right? So you'll get help from the AI internally, but I think that that self-service side of it gets so much better uh, with these techniques. And I, I like the concept that there'll be a sort of an ecosystem of complementary AI technologies mm -hmm. with the large yeah. language models and then the very specific tools that will, you know, allow you to understand customers better, mine intent better and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is always what I what I tell customers who are in a, uh, you know, a CX type of role 
is that it's, you know, it's not about one size fits all. It's about what are you specifically trying to do? What are you trying to do on a channel or a touch point? Um, what things can you reuse across them for sure? But as you think about specific AI techniques that you hear about and you want to know how that can apply to your business, I always point back to what are you actually solving for, right? It's not about throwing technology because it's cool. It's about what does that technology actually bring you in terms of the journeys you're trying to manage, the goals you're trying to reach with your customers. Um, and that that's you know going to be what you were doing last year is probably not different in that regard. So many of those things are evergreen, but you know, there's new ways to unlock those solutions now that um, are going to be pretty exciting. Fantastic. Well, Brett, thank you so much for joining us in the green room. This has been a really fascinating session. Really thanks enjoyed learning me. more about generative AI and everything that we're doing at Genesis with you. So thanks again. And thank you for joining us. Uh, please do like, comment and share on this LinkedIn live stream. And we hope to see you next time.